Hi. I'm just going to do a quick demo of the new MQ availability model. This is called Native HA. Um, we've just released it in 9.2.2, so that's in March 2021 as a, an early release. Not quite there for production yet. We're busily working on that in the background, but we've got it out there so we can get into your hands and then you can have a try with it. So what I'm going to be showing you is, is how that works. Um, and it's something that works uh, at this point in time inside OpenShift. So I have an OpenShift deployment. Um, this happens to be in IBM Cloud using the managed OpenShift environment. Um, it's deployed across multiple availability zones for sort of the best possible availability. And what I've installed into that is the, the operators needed to sort of manage and deploy MQ. So I have IBM MQ operator here. So if I click into that, then this is the way that I can very easily, if you're not familiar, create and manage my queue managers, my runtime, my, my messaging runtimes. So I'm going to create an instance, which is going to create a queue manager. Very, very simple. Um, I can just give it a name. So if I say uh, demo native HA, I need to accept the license, as we always do. Then for this particular situation, I need to pick a particular license. So I'll write those instructions of which you need to, to use. This is just because I'm showing you the, the new capability and that new capability, like I said, it's not there for production yet, so you have to pick the right license to, to allow you to use it. And accept the T's and C's. Right, so this is like a standard deployment of, of a queue manager, a very, very simple one. So now I'm going to tweak it slightly so that we get the new availability um, capability. So if I go into the queue manager, I can pick availability, and from there I pick native HA. Simple as that. It's all I have to do to enable the availability. The only other thing I need to do for this particular deployment is I need to switch for storage. Because this one was set up, like I said, as a very, very simple one, this quick start one, which I'm modifying, then I'm basically going, look, rather than ephemeral storage, which means if the queue manager restarts, it disappears, I want persistent claims. I want persistent volumes underpinning this queue manager because if I have a failure, and this is highly available, I obviously want the messages that were in the queue manager to be available wherever it restarts. And I'll explain how that works in just a minute. So once I've done those two things, I can click on create. And it's as simple as that. That is now deploying out um, a new queue manager with everything it needs to be able to run um, both for your applications to connect in and to run in OpenShift. So it's deploying all the services, um, the routes and the um, storage to get it up and running. So that's going to take a, take a few minutes. So while that's going on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip to one I prepared earlier. So we've got a single instance queue manager here. Now the single instance queue manager is, is the very, very simple one. Now the very, very simple one, if we go in and look at resources, and I look at the stateful set and the pods, I've got one pod. So that single pod has got the container which has got the queue manager running in. So MQ fits very nicely into, the, into a container. Um, it's very compact, it's very small and isolated. You can see here it's just sat there ticking over and it's at 0.023 of a core, so a tiny amount of resource just to have that messaging resource sat there ready and waiting for your applications to be able to send in you know, as many messages as it wants to do to achieve um, whatever it needs to um, accomplish. Now, it's obviously not doing anything at the moment because I'm just using it here to demonstrate these sort of failure scenarios. So with this single pod, we are relying totally on OpenShift and therefore Kubernetes to manage and maintain it. So what that means is it gets deployed and we tell um, OpenShift that we always want one instance of this. And then it becomes OpenShift's responsibility to monitor it and make sure that if anything happens to it, it'll restart it redeploy it and make sure it comes back up again and there's always one instance. So that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? We don't have to worry from an MQ point of view, an application point of view, about the availability of it. So I'm going to demonstrate that and then I'm going to talk through the limitations behind that. So if I click delete, delete pod, it's not deleting the queue manager, this is just saying, right, okay, I'm going to stop this pod, this container. That's going to make uh, OpenShift detect that and then go in and try and reschedule it. So we're going to click delete and we can see from the status it's gone down into terminating and it's dropped from a ready state of one one as in one of one down to zero of one so that's saying it's now no longer ready as we'd expect because we deleted it 
and OpenShift is now going to be going, well, hang on a minute, I was expecting to have one of those. Let me just check for sure that it's not there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and reschedule it and I'm going to bring it back up and run it. So we're going to see that happening in the background while I'm talking. So there's a number of problems with this approach. One is you can see it still hasn't gone to ready. So at that point, the availability is not particularly fast. Now, OpenShift and Kubernetes, therefore, will do the recovery in certain situations, which I'll come on to. But from that point of view, it doesn't do it particularly quickly. Now, it can sort of rely on that when the workload is lots and lots of instances of stateless applications, because at that point, what that means is, um, is that I could have lots and lots of instances normally running. And if I lose a fraction of them, then OK, then I drop my capacity, but I'm not dropping my availability. And I'll get them back within, you know, um, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, something like that. And you can see while I was talking, um, actually, that pod came back. So it was in that sort of in that sort of range of maybe a half a minute to a minute sort of time to do it. But if you've got a, a, a solution where you really need to get to a particular thing, which in this situation, I've got a single queue manager. Now, there are many reasons why you wouldn't want to have single queue manager. You want to go for an active active deployment, but I'm just keeping it simple here. So in this situation, you do want to get back to that queue manager and you want it up as available as quickly as possible. So the time it took was good, but not brilliant. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is it'll actually only restart this pod for certain failure scenarios. There are other failure scenarios where actually Kubernetes and OpenShift will choose not to restart that pod. Now, those examples are things like if I have a node failure, so or I have an availability zone failure, so I lose a particular availability zone. At that point, Kubernetes doesn't really know whether the other side has really stopped or it's just lost contact with it. And when you've got a stateful service running, like MQ is, because it's looking after your messages, then at that point, it will err on the side of caution. It won't restart it because it thinks, well, actually, no, I can't risk having two of these running in parallel because you only wanted one of them. So I'll keep it down. I'd rather have zero rather than two. So it just doesn't restart it. So that means from an availability point of view, first problem was it's not very fast. Second problem is it doesn't always come back and you have to operationally go in and say, no, 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 I now know that it's stopped and therefore can you restart it somewhere else? The third problem, which is also a very significant problem, is around that persistent storage underneath the queue manager that I showed you when I was creating one a minute ago. Now that persistent storage, in this situation, with this queue manager, which is deployed into this multi-AZ um, OpenShift cluster, that storage would need to be available to this queue manager no matter where it wanted to run. So across all those different availability zones. Which means I've got to have a storage layer which provides me replicated storage, consistent replicated storage across those different availability zones. So that if I have a failure in one, I've still got access to the storage elsewhere. And if I've got access to the storage elsewhere, then I can restart it. If I don't, then the queue manager won't come back up. So from that point of view, I've got to have a storage layer deployed, which provides me exactly what I need. Now, that's actually not something you get with Kubernetes or OpenShift. That's something that you have to a layer on top. So there are storage solutions out there. So from an OpenShift point of view, various ones you could plug in. One would be OpenShift Container Storage, um, which we know works So from uh, of how MQ wants it. So from that point of view, you could use that. But it is an extra thing you've got to live with and manage and maintain and understand as you deploy out your MQ runtimes. So from that point of view, it's definitely not ideal. So you've got those three particular problems, which mean this availability model is not the best one. Now, what we've been doing with MQ in the past is we've been saying, well, we can overcome the first two, the speed of recovery and the recovering in all situations. If you deploy MQ as a multi-instance option, at that point, we would deploy two pods. And those two pods, pods would use shared storage. So that sophisticated replicated storage, which I told you about, you would need that underneath it still. And we would rely on that to do the replication. And now we'd be relying on it to provide us locking semantics so that we could detect a failure and restart. So now the dependency on the file system is even greater. And the way that the file system works um, becomes more and more critical to how the queue manager works. So we get better availability, but we get a higher reliance on this file system. 
The map, like I said, is not the best way because you've then got to make sure that the file system is working exactly as you want it and you've got to look after it and maintain it. So, that said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip back to my MQ operator and look at queue managers. Now, while I was talking, the one that I kicked off a minute ago, or eight minutes ago, when I was talking for quite a while, um, has started up. So I could have used the one that I pr created previously, but I'll actually use the one that I've just created just to show there's nothing in my sleeve. If I now go into resources, there's a bit more resources. Now, mainly because what you'll find if we go into a stateful set and look at the pods, is we've now got three pods. We haven't got a single pod, we've got three pods all running now. Now, these are all actively running. And what they're doing is they've each got now a persistent volume claim. So they've each got a piece of persistence. And that is where the MQ data is going to be stored to. Now, rather than relying on the file system to, to have a, for MQ to see a single copy and the file system to do the replication and the availability, MQ is taking on that responsibility. So each of these pods has its own piece of persistence. And as updates come in, so messages get put and got from, from say, the queue manager, then those updates are being replicated, synchronously replicated, across the different pods, which means at that point, one of them could fail and another one could take over. So similar sort of model to, say, that multi-instance model or RDQM, if you're familiar with MQ running, say, on a Linux VM, but it's all happening inside MQ. That replication is happening inside, and that consistency across the replicas is happening in as well. So with that, you no longer have that dependency for that um, sophisticated storage layer. This is using simple block storage, read-write once, three separate instances of that across the three different pods. Now, we're also following a very common sort of cloud pattern and implementation of how you get consistency across them. So if you're familiar with consistency and um, consensus algorithms, then you might be familiar with something called Raft. Raft is, a, a, is an algorithm that defines how do I actually ensure that when I'm making all these critical updates, those updates are consistent across multiple copies, and how do I make sure that only the right copies are actually active and those are the ones that are being written to. And that's what we've pushed right into the heart of MQ. So what we have now is we have these three pods running um, under Raft in consensus with a leader follower pattern. So MQ will automatically elect one of these instances to be the leader. And that leader is where your connections are automatically rooted into. That's what some of the other and resources under that queue manager were showing you. That's how you, we automatically get the traffic in. You don't have to find it as an application. That's where the updates will go. And then those will be replicated out to the other um, pods, as you can see here. So if we look at this, they're all running because they're all sort of active and they're all um, getting the, the replication happening. But one of them is the leader. And it's the one that's marked as ready 1-1. One, one. That means one of one, i.e. this one is the one where the traffic is going to go into. So we know that pod zero is the active one, there's the leader in this state. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the same demo. I'm going to delete that one. So it's going to go through the same cycle. OpenShift will eventually detect it and it will eventually restart it. But in the meantime, we want to overcome, we've overcome the storage problem already. Um, we want to then can we tackle um, the first problem and the second problem, which is the speed of recovery and the recovery in all environments. Now, that recovery across, sorry, all failures, that one we can cover thanks to the consensus that I just talked to you about, because we're no longer reliant on OpenShift to detect the problem. So we know, thanks to consensus and Raft, exactly when one is not available, and we can make sure that that becomes unavailable if everyone else thinks it is. So we know we've got consistency. So then we're just going to see in the demo, we're going to see the speed of recovery because now it's under our control. So I'm going to do delete on that top pod. So we can see it goes into terminating and you'll see the ready state goes down from zero to one. And now the other two pods, they're now detecting that this has um, failed. And as we saw there, if you just noticed it, pod one has gone to ready, which means it took, what was that? Maybe, I don't know, four or five seconds to detect that failure and come back up again. So much, much faster than relying on OpenShift. And you're going to have to take my word for it, but those failures would be detected no matter what the, um, the problem was. So if we had a no failure or an AZ failure, 
we would do exactly the same logic and exactly the same speed of recovery. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of an insight and, and you can see what's going on from a native HA point of view. Um, thank you very much.